and get us started. Thank you so much. So welcome everyone. This is the National Girls Collaborative Project National Webinar Addressing STEM Stereotypes and Biases, Facilitating ch Challenging Conversations with Youth. I'm Marissa Garcia. I am a Senior Program Developer with the National Girls Collaborative Project. Happy to be bringing this webinar to all of you today. A few housekeeping points. Um, this webinar is being recorded. We will share the recording afterwards along with the PowerPoint presentation, a resource document, and any other relevant and important information for all of you. Live transcription is turned on. If you would like to see it on your um, screen, you can click the dot, 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 more button and have that appear for you on your screen. You can also see, see select see full transcript and see kind of the history of the conversation as it goes along. And with that, I am going to go ahead and get us started. If we can go to the next slide and I will end our poll. Thank you for responding. The vision of the National Girls Collaborative Project is to support and create science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM, experiences that are as diverse as the world we live in. To do this, NGCP connects, creates, and collaborates with a network of advocates to promote equity and transform STEM for all girls and youth. NGCP exists because today's STEM experiences continue to lack diversity. Many young people do not identify with the field. To create change, our work empowers providers, educators, leaders, and youth themselves. Next slide, please. The NGCP believes STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. Our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders and via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and webinars like this one. NGCP also strengthens the capacity of programs by producing and sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. We distribute these resources in accessible formats such as train the trainer programs, partnerships, and online platforms. Next slide, please. The National Girls Collaborative Project engages in many activities virtually and nationally, as well as through local collaboratives. NGCP partners with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap Into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute and the Million Girls Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Networks, serving hundreds of educators via large local networks. NGCP is currently working with Lida Hill Philanthropies and has launched the If Then Collection, a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These are available at no cost. NGCP also hosts the Girls Advisory Board. The Girls Advisory Board helps to review and provide feedback on current National Girls Collaborative Project initiatives and assist in informing the future direction of the NGCP. NGCP manages the Connectory, the largest national database of STEM opportunities, the Connectory also provides a way for program providers to connect and collaborate with each other. And Fab Femmes, which is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They are passionate about the work they do and ready to connect with programs to spark girls' interests. We offer regular webinars such as this one, focused on research and exemplary practices to help our network grow and thrive. And locally, state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings, providing professional development mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available and distribute their own regular newsletters spotlighting local resources. Next slide, please. The National Girls Collaborative Project has been partially funded by the National Science Foundation since 2002. We began as the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project focused on Washington and Oregon. And then as we presented our collaboration model to others, we were invited to expand across the United States. While NGCP programs and partners are located in every state, we have 33 collaboratives serving 41 states, facilitating collaboration between 42,500 organizations who serve 20.2 million girls and 10 million boys. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our speakers today, Sarah Kobilka. Sarah Kobilka is the owner and principal consultant for Renaissance Women Consulting, LLC. 
Sarah is passionate about education, communication, outreach, networking, and DEIA issues. She has spent years specializing in science communication, in TV, radio, education, and the nonprofit realm, and utilizing her training as a scientist, journalist, and educator to bridge the gaps between the scientific community and those who consider themselves to be outside of it. Sarah is involved nationally in diversity in STEM and STEM engagement initiatives that seek to inspire interest and excitement for STEM broadly. Sarah enjoys a Renaissance woman lifestyle filled with unusual adventures and intriguing people. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you, Marissa. It is so exciting to be here today and to give you a little bit of background information about how this webinar topic came to be. So uh, the first thing that we wanted to share with you, there's already a link in the chat for it, and it's on the next slide. It's the State of Girls and Women in STEM. It's a report that NGCP put together. I highly recommend it. It's really simple, two-page document, lots of great statistics on the first page, and just full of new relevant resources on the second. A few things to highlight from that is that we already know that girls and young women's achievement in mathematics and science, it's on par with that of boys and young men. You look at the science and math test scores when you're looking at high school students, for example. Girls are doing just fine. There is no reason to think that they can't do these do these topics. Another area that we're going to be addressing is talking about diversity. We know that Latinx, Black, and Indigenous women represent less than 10% of women in the STEM workforce, which is not representative of how many of them there are in the greater society. Part of the reason why this is happening is due to stereotypes and bias in the field of STEM. And the way I got into interest in this very specific topic, if you wanna to move to the next slide, is because of a presentation that I was doing. I was working with Nancy Coddington, who's the Director of Science at WSKG, and is also with me on the New York Girls STEAM Collaborative Leadership Team. And we're both SciGirls trainers, and we um, were doing a SciGirls training, a virtual training for New York State Network for Youth Success with the new SciGirls strategies. And some of you may be familiar with the old SciGirl 7. They got rid of the number, but there's still great strategies for how to engage youth with STEM. And one of the new things that came up in their strategies is strategy number four, which you'll see on the next slide. And strategy number four, I like to think, is probably the most unique of all the strategies in the new SciGirl strategies. It wasn't really highlighted in the past, and from the current research that they looked at to make the adjustments to the strategies, this was something that really spoke. And that is to encourage girls to identify and challenge STEM stereotypes. So we need to support girls in pushing against existing stereotypes and the need to conform to gender roles and help them make connections between their unique cultural and, society and social backgrounds and STEM disciplines will negate potential stereotype barriers. But if you're wanting them not only to identify, but to challenge the stereotypes, that puts the onus and some of the work on you who are working with the youth and not just girls needing to know about stereotypes. Boys, students who are binary, whatever, all youth really need to have this in front of them. But that means for those of us who are working with those youth, how do we help create the right environment, ask the right questions, just facilitate those conversations, which could get difficult at times. So during the training, Nancy and I decided to give the people in the after school environment who were part of the training a chance to actually practice having a difficult conversation that Nancy and I facilitated. So on the next slide, you're going to see information specific to STEM identity and one aspect of it. And one aspect is how students, girls see themselves and how others see them in relationship to concepts of femininity. So the ideas of warmth, sensitivity, cooperation, belonging, sometimes some people believe, oh, that doesn't match with science or mathematics or technology or engineering. I need to be more feminine. And so some organizations have attempted to tap into that idea of femininity and say, oh, science is a feminine thing. So the next slide is gonna be a video that we're gonna be showing. 
And I think we should be able to show maybe about 30 seconds of it. It's from 2012. It's the European Commission that created the video to inspire more high school girls to pursue careers in STEM. And some of you may be smiling and nodding if you've seen this video before. Um, we asked our participants to just note how it tries to tap into femininity. So we're going to give it a try and see if the audio and video will work for us. And if not, I'll explain a little bit. Okay, let's get a pause. So you get a little taste of what this is, uh, what this video is like. Um, there was a huge pushback against the video when it came out. But what we did is we showed the video and we had a conversation with all of our participants and a number of them may have responded in the way that some of you have responded. Maybe you felt that there was a sexualization of the women. The man is the one doing science. The women are just striking poses. Some a lot of us have had that negative response, but we had people who said, wait, no, I always thought, you know, being a chemist was a boy thing, but they're doing makeup that appeals to me. And so it did touch on femininity for them. So Nancy and I had the opportunity to kind of lead that delicate conversation where everybody's perspective was respected. And so we're going to talk about tips, tricks, things to think about philosophically, what the research tells us about this. And we've got a wonderful lineup of speakers today to help us with that process. So I'm going to introduce two of our upcoming speakers who I personally recruited because they are some of my mentors. Um, I'm going to start off with introducing Michelle Higgins and Timothy Fowler. So Michelle Hig or I'll start with Timothy. He actually works for the New York State Network for Youth Success, who I was leading the Sci Girls training for. And he's the professional development director of the New York State Network for Youth Success success. As the professional development director, Timothy oversees all of the network's professional development and technical assistance work, along with the organization's STEAM work, including leading the statewide National Girls Collaborative STEAM project. Tim's, Timothy's work includes leading workshops and trainings, ensuring compliance with state requirements for training, providing coaching to individuals, and providing technical assistance on issues related to after school, summer, and expanded learning programs. He previously worked for the Missouri After School Network, coordinating technical assistance for the state's 21st Century Community Learning Center grantees. He has more than 25 years of experience working with youth and children in a variety of community organizations. Michelle Higgins is the Associate Director of the University of Arizona's Office of Societal Impact and former Associate Director of the Research, of Research and Evaluation at the UA STEM Learning Center. Higgins works to bring together people, resources, and research to build a more diverse population of lifelong STEM learners. In 2013, she co-founded Imagine Your STEM Future, an in-school STEM mentoring program that serves more than 140 girls each year. And that is actually where I got introduced to that video because I worked with Michelle on that particular program. Higgins is active in local and national initiatives for STEM equity. She currently serves as Arizona Vice President and STEM Chair for the American Association of University Women and is a national advisor for the Twin Cities Public Television Sci Girls in National Parks. Higgins holds a third degree black belt in Tang Soo Do and is continuing her training in Kempo Karate. And then we decided let's add another voice. And so I'm going to let Marissa introduce our third speaker. Thank you. Yes, we are also excited to be joined tonight or today um, by Amanda Sullivan. Amanda Sullivan is a researcher and educator whose work focuses on the impacts of technologies on young children and addressing STEM stereotypes. She has worked on several early childhood robotics and coding technologies during her time with Tufts University's DevTech Research Group. Amanda received her master's and PhD in child development from the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts University. Amanda has over a decade of experience teaching early childhood and elementary school STEAM, robotics, coding, engineering, drama, film production, and more. Amanda is the author of Breaking the STEM Stereotype, Reaching Girls in Early Childhood, 
As a mother, Amanda also works to encourage parents to get their children exposed to STEM early and often. And we were excited to have Amanda join this conversation with her depth of knowledge in research and in working with young children. So thank you, Amanda, for joining us, as well as Timothy and Michelle. And um, I have shared a resource page there in the chat. I'll copy it once more in case some folks joined um, just a few moments ago and missed it. And um, this resource page has all of the different links and resources that will be shared by our speakers throughout the webinar. So you can feel free to open it and follow along, or you can open it after the webinar on your own time and do some more investigation. And with that, we're gonna turn it over to Amanda to get us started. Hi everyone, I hope you can see and hear me okay. I'm just so thrilled and honored to be amidst such great speakers and inspiring attendees learning with and from you all today. I'm here to talk a little bit about my work at the early childhood level as it pertains to stereotypes and how stereotypes might impact girls and youth in general, their interest and their behaviors towards STEM and technology at an early age. If you move on to the next slide, um, so why are we talking about early childhood? Some of the statistics we looked at earlier um, focus on the career world and women's representation in STEM in their professional lives. Um, we saw a little bit about thinking about talking and engaging adolescents and young women around these talks about stereotypes and the portrayal of STEM. And this is great, but actually, if we think about when children are actually starting to form stereotypes. It's probably happening a lot earlier than many people are aware of. And so it's really important to start, not wait until youth are older to start having these conversations and these interventions. It's really important to start young and start fostering that open communication and uh, awareness from an early age. So basic stereotypes begin to develop in young children around ages two to three. And by age five, when most kids are starting kindergarten, they've already developed a range of stereotypes and stereotyped beliefs about gender, gender roles, career fields, and general abilities and who can and should be pursuing different uh, activities. And, you know, this is a normal part of cognitive development for young children. This isn't necessarily a problem, right? At this age, kids are taking in vast information about the world around them. And the only way to make sense of it is to try to place them into categories, neat little categories in their minds, and try to basically organize the chaos of all the new information that they're taking in. So this is actually a normal piece of early childhood development, but it's our role as educators and those of us who are caregivers or work with young children to be aware that this is happening and work to expand upon these viewpoints, expand upon these categories, contradict them or contrast them with different images or examples when needed. And not just to think, well, they're five, so they'll they'll grow out of this idea that all boys like blue and girls don't like blue, but to really uh, be aware and to talk about and address these things that are coming up. If you move on to the next slide, this is a quick snapshot of some of the research that I've conducted in this area of STEM stereotypes and girls engagement in STEM at the early childhood pre-K and kindergarten level through second grade. And what I found in my own work is that, you know what, young children do already have these biased opinions about STEM-related content as early as kindergarten, and actually anecdotally even younger, but the research we conducted started at kindergarten. And what that looked like were masculine biases around uh, who math and science apps were created for, certain conceptions like, boys are better at building with things like Legos. Um, these are the types of viewpoints that young children were forming at that time. And this is children of all gender identities that were forming these very masculine uh, 
male dominated already ideas about STEM and technology. And more recently, I've been conducting research at the high school level. You know, here I thought branching out a little bit away from my early childhood research. And what I found was that on competitive high school robotics teams, female students had significantly less confidence than their male counterparts and were coming in with less experience. And while this research study wasn't in, in anticipated to have anything to do with early childhood, here it came up organically again in feedback from team mentors as well as team participants themselves, noting that many of the young women on the teams had way less experience and exposure to Legos, building, engineering, coding and robotics initiatives in their early childhood and elementary school years. So here, once again, we see the importance of starting to have these conversations and reaching all students early on. If you move on to the next slide, so we know it's important to start early, but how the heck do we do it when we're talking about three, four, five-year-old kids? Well, there's actually lots of different ways we can begin to address stereotypes early on. And talking about them is just one of the ways that we can do this and attempt to make a, a difference in the lives of young children. And so I will be focusing on talking about stereotypes because that is the theme of today's webinar. But I did want to mention that all of these other tips and strategies that you see on screen work together with this idea of talking. Um, having these hard and often difficult conversations is incredibly important, but action is also really important. And a lot of the research shows that young children are having different experiences with their exposure to different tools and play activities based on gender. And so this is something that we need to be cognizant of when we're thinking about all the different ways that we can address stereotypes with young children. If you move on to the next slide, this is sort of getting at the strategies of how we actually go about having these conversations with very, very young children. And, you know, it could be a whole webinar in itself to go through all of these different strategies, but I want to hone in on a few different things. So the first thing is that when we're talking about very young children, there is so much happening in their play, their imaginary play, their dramatic play, the play and conversations that they're having at lunch and recess. And this is where kids are trying on different ideas about their own identities, their gender roles, what they see emulated by adults in their world. This is a place where kids are pushing boundaries. They're testing out sometimes sensationalized ideas and statements and seeing how people react, right? Play is learning. That's the work of young children. So it's this is a place where if you really listen and observe, you are going to hear all sorts of stereotype statements around gender and other background, um, cultural background, ethnicities, and, and things that kids are processing in their own way through play. And what is really easy for adults to do is to say, well, that's their play and that's okay, they're five, we don't need to talk about that. But it's important to remember that your silence is really reinforcing these stereotype views that young children have. Remember, I mentioned they're starting with these neat little categories and our work is to expand upon them. So be sure to be listening into the play and bringing in themes, actions, ideas that you're seeing into conversations, into circle time discussions, morning meetings, finding books, picture books, I'll show some suggestions later on that can contrast and expand upon some of the things that you're hearing kids say. The other thing to remember when you're having these conversations with young children is that our language choice is really important. And usually we are really hyper aware when we're sitting down to have a very meaningful conversation with young children, but we're less aware the other 99% of the time when we're just talking to one another, or we're having casual conversations with each other. And so it's important to remember that young children are always listening and observing. And there's some research that shows that overgeneralized statements, even positive ones, can cue young children to think in terms of social stereotypes. So even overgeneralized positive statements, like all girls can be anything they want when they grow up, still 
prompts young children to think that this idea of um, categorizing based on being a girl is an important way to look and think about the world. So being careful about that and honing in on individuals and specifics is really important. But there's no way around the fact that having these conversations with young children is often very difficult. And I know, I, I believe as a mom and an educator that this is because we don't want to believe that the students and the kids that we care about are growing up in an unjust or unfair world. But the sad truth is that they are. And so I think that honing in with our conversations on this idea that unfair things can be changed is so important, however you go about having these conversations with young children. And even at this young early childhood age, we can engage them as agents of change. So whatever injustice or stereotype or bias you, you've brought to the table and you're, you're talking about with your youth, try to end those conversations with, what is one thing that we can do to address this? What is one change that we each can make to positively impact this, this unfair thing that we've been talking about? And that really lends a more positive lens to what is often a difficult conversation to have. And it also makes things more personally meaningful for young children. There's more of a takeaway when they're going to be doing some sort of action on their own. If you move on to the next slide, if anyone is interested in delving more into this topic, specifically as it relates to early childhood and engaging girls in STEM, please check out my book, Breaking the STEM Stereotype, which really is all about this, how to, how to you know, implement change with young children, youth of all gender and background identities, but as well as fostering these conversations with other adults and bringing awareness to other teachers and administrators who might be working with the young children that you serve. These are some examples of picture books. They're all going to be in the resource sheet that was mentioned and links in the chat. Um, thinking about representation, it really matters at the early childhood level, not just in terms of the real life role models that people are meeting, but the picture books, the media, and the things that you're showing to them. If you move on to the next slide, if anyone is interested in keeping in contact and thinking and talking about this more, please feel free to shoot me an email or connect with me on the web or social media. And I'm uh, really excited to hear some of your thoughts in the chat and at the Q&A later on. But now I'm going to throw it over to our next amazing speaker that we have. Thanks so much. I'm really um, excited to be here and to um, really learn from you all. So um, I just wanted to say that before going to the U of A, I spent about 10 years um, doing science and engineering programs for um, girls and their families at Girl Scouts of Southern Arizona. And that's where I really got a, a great foundation on working with girls in STEM. And so I'm truly a per program person at heart. And when I think about um, having conversations with girls, difficult conversations or sensitive conversations, I think about what activity do I need to do and what is the space gonna look like? Um, and so I wanna just share with you today how I think about engineering spaces for conversations with girls. Next slide. So I have a two-pronged approach, and um, I'm doing my best to lay this all out for you all because I think this just kind of happens in my head. This I normally don't follow something that is as formal as this present presentation, but I wanted to capture kind of my thought processes. So I start with the Girl Scout leadership framework as a framework for my activities. And then I layer that with what, so what, now what questioning strategy. And I will go over each of these pieces. So next slide. So um, this framework is really about um, how we do activities with girls. And all activities uh, incorporate opportunities for girls to discover, um, connect, and take action. Girls begin to discover about themselves, their values, their own potential, and how they're going to use their knowledge and skills to move through the world. 
When the focus of the activity is on their own self-discovery, it opens a door for conversations that also explore challenges they may encounter, such as stereotypes, um, biased expectations from others, or even conflicting values. Um, girls connect with others who have similar values and interests. So we often um, bring in women um, who are professionals in STEM to be mentors in the classroom, to facilitate activities or sit on um, panels. And this opens up a line of communication for the girls. Um, they can ask questions about what it's like to be a woman in a STEM career. And then girls take action to make uh, positive changes in the world. These types of activities require girls to really think about and assess the roots of problems that they notice and want to do something about. And this really means having conversations that challenge the status quo. And girls are often looking at things that happen in their own neighborhoods and asking questions about um, who has access and who doesn't? Why is that so? And who makes these types of choices? So these activities um, that follow, discover, connect, and take action, not only allow the conversations to happen, but it really puts the girl at the center of the conversation and the one who's gonna be driving the questions. Okay, next slide. So discover, connect, and take action can happen when activities are girl-led and involve learn by doing and cooperative learning. These activities have been shown to produce particular outcomes under Discover, Connect, and Take Action. So when girls have a strong sense of self, are critical thinkers, um, seek challenges in the world, develop healthy relationships with others and feel connected to their communities, learn to advocate for themselves and others and feel empowered to do so, they're really um, using these activities as a springboard to start engaging in and having the skills to participate in difficult conversations, conversations that are, are challenging status quo, that are asking deeper questions about um, stereotypes and gender and um, the fluidity of gender and how that um, is, is arising in stereotypes. Okay, next slide. So now that I have activities that kind of prompt these questions um, and conversations, I layer it with a strategy of what, so what, now what for the types of conversations and questioning that the girls can engage in. So they discuss what they learned, what they discovered about themselves, about the, the other girls in their group, and um, how did that happen through the particular activity that they just engaged in. Next, they discover, so what? So what is, what is so special about this activity? Why would I have them to complete this? And this usually leads into conversations about exploring how STEM makes the world a better place for women and girls. So for example, if we do something with solar ovens, that immediately starts the conversation about how solar cooking can alleviate some of the challenges that girls have to getting an education um, or how um, solar, solar water heating is, um, is so important for some of the neighborhoods that we have surrounding Southern Arizona. Finally, um, we ask the girls, now what? And that's the really important question. Um, so now that you've done this, what is your responsibility and what are you going to do about this? Um, so I normally now work with high school girls um, and we have classes in our Imagine Your STEM Future program that are ninth through 12th. Um, and it happens in their school day. And so we have time to really ask the girls, so now what is your responsibility? It's not just that you have this in your head. How are you going to get it out to benefit other girls? And the freshmen are still struggling with who am I 
in STEM and, and what am I doing? By the time when they're sophomores, the girls are absolutely shocked that stereotypes are still happening at, within sort of a population why as a population wide phenomena, they think it's just them. And they ask the question, how come we're not say, teaching this to other younger girls? And they, that's when they start that, oh, now it's my responsibility now that I know this, what can I do? Next slide. So whenever possible, um, so now that we've got the activity, I've got the questioning, I really like these discussions to happen in large whole group circles because it does particular things. One, it designates now is our time to have a conversation together as a whole group, but also because our program happens in the formal classroom, um, we want to bring in informal practices and this is the way that we actually decenter the adult or the teacher or the mentor in the room and redistribute that um, capital to the girls in the group. And finally, it really gives a chance to elevate the conversation to a whole group conversation. In a circle, everybody sees each other. There's no front of the classroom or back of the classroom. And conversations are now directed to each other and they start looking to each other for um, comments, for solutions, for other questions, rather than just me or the, the other adult in the room. Next slide. So this is my conceptual diagram of an engineered space that promotes and supports conversations. So when activities focus on discovering, connecting, and taking action and include um, girl-led, uh, learn by doing, and cooperative learning opportunities, followed with questions of what, so what, and now what, and they take place in a circle I really started to make some observations about girls and their conversations in STEM. One, they have a lot of questions about equity in STEM. Um, I hear every year, even from girls who are in 12th grade, I thought this was resolved a long time ago. Why are we still having this conversation? Two, where are the boys in this conversation? How come the boys aren't at the table with us? And they want the time and the space to, to think, think it through and have a discussion about it and not be told about it. They want to be the ones asking the questions. And some of the outcomes that I've seen that have happened from this is that um, they want to do hands-on activities for other girls. I think they're trying to create that space for elementary and middle school girls that they've experienced. Um, they started making presentations at elementary and middle schools and talking about why it's important to take science and math classes. Um, I don't know if you remember the hashtag, I look like an engineer campaign. Um, girls have started the hashtag, I look like a STEM student to get the word out. And then they also um, enjoy participating on panels uh, at school and in their communities. Next slide. Yep, that's it. So thank you so much for just allowing me to share like my thought process of what I do just to have those conversations with girls. And now it's my turn to hand it off to Mr. Timothy Fowler. Hey, that's me. Hi, everybody. I'm Timothy. Uh, I'm working for the New York State Network for Youth Success. We are the statewide after school intermediary in New York, but you may know us as NYSAN. Uh, our quality self-assessment tool uh, has been shared in uh, other states and around the country. So that's who we are. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so this, the information that I'm going to share with you is based on practical experience. A lot of what I've learned has been through doing and through practical application of a lot of what's talking about. So I started as a peer mediator in high school. So I really learned how to listen and try to understand what's going on behind the conversation to help solve conflict. 
Uh, I became a peer counselor in college where I learned how to listen for emotions and how to help people in crisis um, work through that crisis and connect to resources. Uh, then I started doing youth work and I actually worked in an early childhood classroom that used an anti-bias curriculum. So while Amanda was talking, I was like, yes, testify more and more. We need more of this. Um, but that led me to start working with other age groups because I was like, this is really important work. Like we should be stopping bias and stereotyping everywhere. So I began working with organizations like the National Conference for Community and Justice to do that work with adults and with teens. So I've been doing that since 1994. And then finally in 2002, I got to connect my world of youth work and my world of facilitation uh, and do professional development full time with youth serving organizations. So since then, of course, I've been doing a lot of facilitation, a lot of training and really building on all of those skills. So that's some of what I'm gonna share with you today is what does it mean to tackle tough conversations when you've got a mixed group? You've got uh, men and women and you're talking about sexism. You've got people who are transgender and people who are cisgender and you're trying to tap out gender identity. How do you do that? I tried to advance my own slide. So if we could advance the slide for me, that would be great. Uh, so one of the things that I shared in the resources is just setting the tone. A lot of work happens behind the scenes so that you can have a productive conversation. And I really appreciate that Amanda and Michelle touched on some of those elements like sitting in a circle, uh, making sure that you're addressing the issue and you're not just hoping it disappears by staying silent. So setting the environment is a big piece of it. I really love creating norms with the group I'm working with. So even with adults, sometimes I will say, how are we gonna support each other? How are we gonna create a positive learning environment? And depending on the age group, I may say, what are the rules that we're gonna live by? Because even kids as young as three and four can tell you the rules that they've been taught. You know, So they don't need me to lay rules down on them. We can co-create them and, and then work from there. And that creates a lot of guidance and boundaries for us so that we remember how to treat each other because we talked about it before it was a problem. Youth voice is critical. So co-creating those kinds of norms with young people's participation is important for a couple of reasons. One, it doesn't put the adults in power. It says young people have power too. And if I'm the only adult in the room, it says white men aren't the only ones with power, you have the power. So we share the authority together. I'm still gonna say, hey, let's make sure we're being safe because that's my legal requirement as a person working with youth. But I'm also gonna say, what else do you need? What do you think is good? And that has equal weight as we work through those things. So that should also be happening in activities. So when Michelle was talking about how uh, girls get engaged in activities, young people should have decision-making throughout all stages of the process. What activities are we gonna do? What projects are we gonna do? What's the form of those projects? Uh, all of that decision-making is a great skill. Giving young people the chance to make decisions for themselves really is a good skill for them to make other decisions in their life. They know how to do it. They know how to collaborate. They know how to work as a team. So that skill building should also be a big piece of it. If I get them to have a conversation about what are our norms going to be, they learn how to stand up for their own ideas, but they also learn how to listen to other ideas. So all of this stuff snowballs. It all happens in a very complex way throughout the social interactions. And all of this is about identity development. This is really about who am I? How do I show up? It's not only about our demographics. It's also about our personalities. It's about how we view ourselves. It's about how we want to be in the world and taking action to become that person. So this is all part and parcel of working with you. Next slide, please. So one strategy that I have done with groups is caucus groups, where sometimes if you have a mixed group and mixed can be any number of criteria, it's important to separate those groups. So I'm gonna give an example around uh, sex. So if, uh, we have a group that's diverse around sex identity. I may have three groups. I may have a group of people who identify as male-bodied. I may have a group that identifies female-bodied, and I may have a group that identifies intersex or doesn't want to say where they sit. So that works if you have a critical mass for each group. So I don't necessarily use caucus groups if I know that one of my group is gonna have one person because then you're really just isolating that person and making them feel like they're standing out for whatever the purpose is. But the purpose, if you can divide groups up, is to let groups do their own work. 
So if we're talking about sex, we're also talking about sexism. So to speak on behalf of women for a moment and run the risk of uh, lots of barbs thrown at me for saying this, women, in, when they're talking about sexism, need to build community. They need to have their stories heard, they need to be honored, and they need to know that they're not alone. That is not the same work that men are doing. What men need to do is realize that sexism is real, that they benefit from it, and that their actions are hurting other people that they think are their friends and that they know are their friends. So that work does not need to happen in the same group at the same time because it's really easy for one or the other group to get triggered. You know, men can start denying their responsibility and then the, you know, now you've got battle lines drawn. Uh, and meanwhile, people who are intersex are completely left out of the conversation. So having that kind of conversation, there's work that needs to be done. So it's not just, we're gonna sit here together, young men and boys, people who identify as male-bodied, while the women have their important conversation, we have an important conversation too. We need to talk about how men treat people and what's problematic about that and what are we gonna do about it. One of the resources that I shared in the uh, notes is uh, an educator and writer named Paul Kibble, who is a youth worker in the Oakland area, who in working with young men of color came, you know, had to confront toxic masculinity in the lives of the young men he was serving. He also had to confront racism because he was a white Jewish man working with a primarily African-American and uh, Latino population. And so in really uncovering and reflecting all of that, had a lot of strategies for really addressing this with the group and helping them realize uh, how they were impacted by sexism and how they could work against it and really become allies, but also how it hurt them in a lot of clear ways. So I mentioned him, because I got to see him uh, read his books, but also go through some workshops with him when I was working with teens. And it really changed my approach and made it more active. Uh, a lot of my training up to that point had been dialogue. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it forever. And so really saying, now let's do an activity. Let's explore this. Let's experience it. Let's try to see things from the other person's perspective by doing activities and doing experiences was really uh, helpful for me. Because I would never just talk about STEM with a group, we would do it, we would get engaged. So a lot of this work is about how do we treat others and how do others treat us and what works and what doesn't in all of that. So this work can happen as a, as a group together. So another strategy can be to do fishbowls. So I can say, if you identify as male body, come to the middle, we're gonna form a circle. Everyone else is gonna form a circle around us. They're gonna be quiet and they're gonna observe and witness the conversation. And that can be really powerful because then men can hear what women have to go through on a daily basis. Women can hear how clueless the men are, but how, you know, they want to help. They just have no idea because they've been taught not to notice, not to pay attention. And so that can really help build some bridges, but they're important conversations to have um, so that we realize that part of our problem is that we're talking from completely different points and that can bog down the conversation, right? It inhibits progress. Next slide. So some things I've found really helpful as a facilitator is to recognize all the different ways that people deny accountability when we have these tough conversations. So uh, if I say something that is sexist uh, and stereotypical, somebody might say, Timothy, that was offensive to me and here's why. And I might say, uh, no, it wasn't. That's not offensive at all. And that's denial. I might also say, you're making a mountain out of a molehill, which is blaming the victim, right? I'm the one who caused the problem, but now I'm trying to say that I'm the one that was hurt here, right? You might also hear people claim victimhood and say, I really feel attacked, you know? And so all of this is really flipping away from the issue and really starting to make it a personal uh, debate, right? It's you versus me now. It's not even about the issue or what came up. So reframing and rewriting the past, right? If this comes up later in the day or the next day, like, that's not what I said at all. Or I don't remember that. I don't think that was even an issue. Was I even in the room? You know, like, so now you get into this whole thing. These are just some examples, but there's lots of ways we do this. And it happens all the time. If I knock over the cookie jar and break it, I will do these exact same things to be like, wasn't me. Somebody put that cookie jar where it could be easily broken. Like, I don't know what was going on. So if you recognize these as an adult, you can help work through them because they're really just defense mechanisms, right? Like, I don't wanna be the bad guy and uh, I'm trying to avoid it in any way I can because it's uncomfortable. 
So focusing on the behavior and making that a norm, like we're just talking about the issue. You're a good person. I believe in you. You have strengths and assets. This is a learning opportunity. This is a chance for you to unlearn messages that are harmful because a lot of these stereotypes are taught to us by people we know and care about. So we've just been good students and learned those lessons, but now is a chance to realize maybe there's better lessons out there. Maybe there's other ways that we can deal with this. The other thing I would encourage you to pay attention to is double loop learning. So this is a concept from Chris Argyris that was meant to apply to organizations. Uh, and I think it applies to all groups. It's really don't only reflect on the experience, but also reflect on how we as a group function. So there's the task, right? How did that group go? Did we cover the ground? Did we reach our goals? But then you say, was everyone included? So now what was our process? Was it inclusive? Were there things we couldn't talk about or didn't talk about for reasons? What's that about? Are there things that we're doing secretly that are keeping us from achieving our goals? So having that other loop of examining not only the product, but the process and the group's process can really help you uncover what's going on. Uh, I definitely recommend that kind of process with adults in the program. It can also be really effective with young people. So the older young people get, the more and more they're going to take on some of the roles and responsibilities of the adults in the program. You're trying to get them to self-manage them to the point where they are themselves able to police and say like, hey, wait a minute, that's not, a, that's not in our norms. That's disrespectful, we can do better. So then it's not just me or you or everyone else all the time, it's all of us. Uh, quick star asterisk, I would love to do all of this work in partnership with people who are different. So caucus groups, I would never do a caucus group for a group of women. I would never lead a caucus group for a group of people of color. I would only lead those groups for groups that I share the identity with. So a lot of this work is best when it's in partnership across diversity. Then you've got built-in role models, identity buddies is one way that uh, some of my colleagues have talked about it, um, that, that live in that world and can really help shape that conversation in a much better way. I would not do caucus groups if I was working solo because I don't represent all of the different people in my room. I would acknowledge that up front. Next slide. That's my thank you slide. So I look forward to hearing people's questions and thank you for listening. And stay connected. And I'm going to jump in um, with just a little bit more information from what Nancy and I pulled together when we were originally putting together uh, this topic, facilitating difficult conversations with youth for um, for Psy Girls. And I literally did a Google search of that exact term. And one of the first things I came up with is the website Peace Learner. They've actually got a video series. It's uh, Liz London. Um, which is the next bullet point. She owns her own company, Constructive Communities, and she actually created a video survey. It would be a really great resource if you were doing professional development for your staff to watch some of these videos. Um, she also uses a book by Lee Munoi called The Art of Mindful Facilitation as a basis for a lot of what she talks about. And there's a lot of really great suggestions and strategies that are very much directly implementable. So um, those resources can all be found. A lot of resources can be found on Liz's website. And again, there are links to every single one of these things. If you look on our main resource page, really the field of social justice came to the forefront for being the leadership in having these um, difficult conversations and how to facilitate them. And in particular, we were looking for resources. Side Girls is for middle school, but it's sometimes used in high school, sometimes elementary. And as you've already heard, you do need to differentiate how you're doing it with a group of five-year-olds versus a group of high schoolers. So we kind of wanted to look at different resources for different age groups. Stepupphysics.org. I know um, for, for those who have attended past NGCP webinars, they've been on before. They work with the high school age group and have some suggestions. And then for those of you who are fans of social media, Learning for Justice, which you might have heard of in the past as Teaching Tolerance, that organization, uh, they are at the top of my list for when I'm on Twitter. They are just 
putting out resources on a almost daily or at least a weekly basis that I find are really very valuable. And um, they also have their website, Learning for Justice, and in the Classroom Resources tab, there are specifically teaching strategies that you can implement. And on the next slide, you're going to see something from Step Up Physics. This is actually a poster that they've created that they have um, for those physics teachers who are part of their program to hang in their classroom. So that's another thing to think about. Um, Timothy talked about creating those norms. You can create those norms, but also make sure to have them visible and so that when problems come up, you can reference back to them and to kind of just bring it all together. Um, these difficult conversations, sometimes it's a specific event that happens that, oh my, something happened, we got to talk about this. Sometimes it's just you want to in, um, integrate it into all of the work that you're doing. And in these after school programs, you're having these kids for a longer, longer time period. So a big part of what I think a lot of us have been talking about is that building that safe space, building that place where kids feel comfortable, that they can talk, that their voice is going to be heard. If you try to do this super difficult conversation the very first day that you have a group of, in my case with Michelle, we had a group of high school freshman girls. And not, was, not only was it a little bit difficult that very first day, much of the first semester, it was hard. It takes time to build these types of safe environments, um, but a lot of great resources have been shared that can help you. And so I am going to pass this on to Marissa so that we can jump right now into our Q&A. Thank you. Yes, we are. We're running a little tight on time. I'll invite Kata to stop sharing screen so we can see each other. Um, and some questions came through the chat. But if other folks have questions you'd like to ask live, please use the uh, hand raise reaction uh, feature in Zoom. And we'll invite you to unmute. You can also just type in the chat and say, hi, I have a question. I want to ask it live. Um, but one question we had coming through was specifically for Amanda, the papers that you referenced in your slides, are those available to download for free or is there a subscription or um, behind a paywall for those? I think they should all be available for free with the links that you click, but if for whatever reason the link doesn't take you and it just takes you to the abstract, feel free to email me um, at amanda.sullivan at tufts.edu and I'll be happy to share um, anything with you. And on my website, I have a list of my full publications and 98% of them are about this specific topic. Thank you, um, and thank you for generously sharing those uh, resource or research papers with us. That's fantastic. Uh, we had another question that was kind of more general. Um, there was talk about role models and how just interactions between role models and youth and girls, and just wondering how an interaction with a role model might be different for young kids than it is for maybe older kids like teens. So anyone feel free to jump in if you've got thoughts. Well, I can jump in from the perspective. I was a TV meteorologist for a number of years. So I've gone to talk to five-year-olds about weather and talk to high schoolers. Um, the younger kids, it's great if you can um, prepare the questions ahead of time with them as a group thinking activity. Um, in the moment, it's usually they just want this one time and it's a story or um, it's just, you know, what's your favorite part of your job? So you don't necessarily get asked the questions that allow you to talk about um, biases you might have encountered or stereotypes. Whereas the, the older the kids, I found the more likely they are to start to ask um, those more deep questions, especially as they're getting to that sophomore, junior year when they really are starting to push to think about what career do I wanna have? What do I want my life to look like? Yeah, to echo what Sarah just said, I think at the early childhood level, it's just seeing role models of different backgrounds, identities, and cultures is the important piece. Um, bringing in scientists, engineers, and coders who represent different ways to look at and identify with STEM, that's the critical piece. As, and as she said, those very specific conversations around stereotypes might tend might start to develop a little bit later. And also um, 
if, if you can ever bring in someone that brings in a physical artifact, I think that really uh, helps with young children. So when I come visit, I try to bring like a technology that I worked on or a first prototype of it where it didn't work and it looked completely different. Anything that they can get their hands on will help resonate more connecting that role model or that speaker with whatever career or topic that you're brought in to, to talk about. Thank you so much. And we are we are actually one minute past our time. So I think we're going to have to wrap it up. This was such a robust um, conversation and presentation. So thank you to our speakers, Sarah, Timothy, Amanda, and Michelle for sharing your insights. We really appreciate having you here. Um, I know my mind is kind of swimming with all of these great strategies and tips and resources. And I appreciated Timothy's um, focus on the end of his presentation on reflection, because I feel like I need to take that time for myself to really let this kind of soak in and, and see how it might apply to the work that I am doing. Um, I know some more questions were coming through in the chat. I believe all of our speakers shared their contact information in the slides. You will receive a PDF of these slides. So they have graciously agreed to um, have you reach out to them if you have a specific question for anyone. Um, so feel free to use those contact emails and um, Twitters and websites and all of that to reach out and learn more. And with that, we would just like to let you know about two upcoming National Girls Collaborative Project events. We have a webinar with Tecnolochicas, Transforming the T in STEM on October 5th. And we have a webinar, Bright 2021, Sharing Strategies and Learnings from an Online Summer STEM Program for Girls. So we hope to see you again at a future NGCP webinar. When you leave Zoom, a um, window should pop up with a survey, and there it is from Kata in the chat as well. Thank you, Kata. Um, please take a moment to fill out the survey. Let us know how this webinar was for you. We also invite you to share topics and ideas for future webinars. That's how this very webinar came to be. Um, Sarah graciously reached out to us and said, hey, I have an idea. Can we connect and make it happen? And, and here we are today. So we really listen to those surveys. We take your advice, we take your ideas, and we love to collaborate with you in our network to bring them to you and make them happen. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.